Kum Lena na Black Gemara. It's my Chayy Shabbos Parshas Nasei. We're middle Masechta Yevamis. Today's daf is daf Tzadik Vov, but we will begin from Tzadik Hey Amid Beis by the two dots, about nine lines from the top of the page. Okay, so basically what we had was that Rabbi Yaisi said <clears throat> that we're talking about a case over there where a, a woman, uh, Ruben, let's call it Ruben and Shimon, non-related, married two sisters, Leah and Rachel. And Ruben's wife, Leah, went overseas. And uh, Rachel's husband, Shimon, went overseas. So there's a brother-in-law and your wife went overseas. You were told that both of them have, um, have died. So as a result of that, Ruvain married his wife's sister. He's allowed to. But then his wife came back and his brother-in-law came back. So the Tanle Kama says that the um, Rachel cannot go back to her husband. Obviously, uh, because we had in the mission before, if, if uh, based on a single testimony, you should have done your homework more thoroughly. And even though it's not your fault, you cannot go back to your husband. However, the Tanakama says Reuben could take his, his wife back. She didn't do anything wrong. <coughs> so he can take his wife back. That's the Tanakama. Rabbi Yaisi then makes a cryptic message. Rabbi Yaisi says, anyone that, as a result of your activities, they become usher, then you also become usher. If they don't become usher, neither do you. So there's two sides to it. If they become forbidden to their husbands, then you're also forbidden to your partner. And if they don't become forbidden, then, then you don't become forbidden either. So we now want to understand exactly what Rabbi Yaisi is saying. What Sorry, exactly which, is he saying? Which <clears throat> daf we on? We are on the Tzadik. They were up to the Tzadik on the base. Was it Tzadik? Hey, on the base. Thank you. Okay, the base. So they might come Rabbi Yaisi. What exactly is Rabbi Yaisi saying? He can learn the following. The Karma Tanakama Tanakama says the Ozel Ishta Vigisim Misiyam. So Reuben's wife Leah and his brother in law Shimon, Leah's sister's husband, Rachel's husband went overseas. And what happens? And the Aisha's Gisir Tanakama says unequivocally when they both come back, they were told they died and they'd come back. So uh, his brother in law cannot go back to his wife anymore because his wife is a married woman and lived with Reuben. Therefore, she cannot go back to her husband. She should have done more homework. And on the other hand, Reuben's wife, Leah, can go back to the original husband, the Easter Shai permitted. That's what the Tanakhama says. And then Kamala, Rabbi Yeshi, Rabbi Yeshi argues and says, no, there's no distinction between the two. Whatever happens to one happens to the other. And therefore, the first way of learning Gemara wants to think they have to be, Rabbi Yeshi is trying to be lenient. Rabbi Yeshi is going to say that since Reuben can take back his original wife because she didn't do anything wrong, so too then Shimon, the brother-in-law, can take back his original wife because the, the din should be the same in both both. Maybe come the Bible says, just like Ruben to take back his original wife, So Shimon should be able to take back his original wife, Leah's sister. Says, but well, it can't be. Now, what you want to say that Bible is being lenient, it can't be. The wording is all wrong. In other words, according to you, because Ruve is allowed, is permitted to take back his first wife, therefore Shimon can take back his wife. Then the wording of Rabbi Yaisi is totally wrong. So what it should have said is, um, why does he say, sorry, kosher ain't place of their chedim, if you don't ruin anybody else, in other words, if Shimon can take back his wife, ain't place of their asma, then you can take back your own wife, the way you're saying it now should be the other way around, kosher ain't place of their asma, because Ruben did not disqualify his own wife, he can take his wife back, therefore ain't a place of their chedim, therefore Shimon can take back his wife, that's what it should have said, Vela, so you're right that both of them have the same law, according to Rabbi Yaisi, Reuben with his partner and Shimon with, with his partner, but it's exactly the opposite. Because the fact of the matter is, because the Rachel lived with you, Reuben, you now disqualified Rachel from going back to her husband because she relied on a single witness that her husband is dead, turned out to be that he wasn't, and therefore we punish her, she should have been more careful. So because of you, Shimon cannot take back his wife, says Rabbi Yaisi, then if you ruin somebody else's life, it's not fair that you should be able to continue to live with your wife. So therefore, you also cannot live with your wife anymore. Just like, just like Shimon, cannot go back to his wife. So to your wife, is forbidden to you. Says he, but okay, that explains that first part of Rabbi Yaisi where he says that since you ruined other people's lives, your own life is ruined. But the other side of Rabbi Yaisi is, and if you don't ruin other people's lives, neither is yours. What's that case referring to? That makes 
kosher paisel, but what about the other part? Kosher ain't a paisel mavite. What's the case over there? Rabbi is saying, if you don't ruin other people's lives, neither do you ruin your own. What, what's the case there? So we're going to have two ways of learning the Gemara. One is Rabbi Ami's way, and one is Rabbi Nafcha's way. Rabbi Ami's way is basically based on what we learned before. There's a difference between a single witness and two witnesses. If a single witness tells a woman your husband is dead, she should have done more homework. If she marries somebody else and the husband turns up, we she say Tate say Mizer, Mizer, and all the penalties in the Mishnah because it's her fault. She should have been should have done a due diligence. But if there were two witnesses that said that her husband is dead, then according to the Torah, that's it. You don't have to do anything more. And therefore, she can go back to her original husband. So based in, and that's what Rabbi Yaisi is going to say. There's a difference whether we're talking about a single witness or two witnesses. And he goes as follows. This extenuation of the first Mishnah needs to be bezin. If the only way you got married because the bezin ruled single witness is good enough, Tate say she, the, the Mishnah said she has to leave her husband, both of them. Up to a carbon. On the other hand, she's exempt from being a carbon because she listened to a bezin. But I'll be aiding if she relied on two witnesses. Tate say she leaves a second husband, but she can go back to her first husband and chayev is carbon. But she does bring a carbon because the fact that she lived in sin, she was a married woman, lived in sin. You have to go to bezin. And the advantage of going to a bezin, single witnesses, she part the carbon. She relied on a ruling of bezin. Yet, so this is what happens. The comment on the Katana says, I don't care what witness, I don't care two witnesses, I don't care if Shimon's wife, yeah, Loishna, be aiding the Asia's Gisa Sharia, I hold the Loishna, love it. I don't care generally if there were two witnesses. If there are two witnesses, then Shimon can take his wife back because she relied on two witnesses, even though she was a married woman and she was somebody else. The din is when the man comes back, she can go back to her husband. Loishna, I'll be bezin, and I don't care if it's based on a single witness, and therefore the bezin rule she can go. The age is gisa asida, and there the case is that she cannot go back to husband. I don't care whatever happens to Shimon's wife and Shimon. I don't care whether they're permitted to each other, forbidden. But Reuben is always permitted to his original wife. Who come let Abiyasi disagrees. He says no. It depends. The two sides are the side that he forbids and the side that he permits is depending if it's single witness or two witnesses. Who come let Abiyasi be bezin if it's based on a bezin a single witness. The place like the chayin since you ruin Shimon's life because Shimon cannot take his wife back. Place like the atzma. Therefore, Reuven cannot take back his original wife. You ruin Shimon's life. Your brother's life. You too cannot take back your original wife. But I'll be aiding, but if it was based on two witnesses, the Ainu Pais are there Khadim. If it's based on two witnesses, uh, with that we're, for those who just came in the Tzadik Hey in the base, we're just revising the Gemara that uh, we did on Friday, and we're in the second white line. But if it's based on witnesses, the Ainu Pais are there Khadim, that he does not disqualify by two witnesses, she can go back to her husband, then Ainu Pais are there, then Reuven can take back his original wife. That's the way it of Ami learns. Comes when Rabbi Nafkin says, no, I actually don't learn this way at all. I don't think this is a continuation of the previous Mishnah. And I'll tell you how I learned. I learned that the reason why, a different reason altogether. You know why if, if a married woman was told by a witness that um, your husband died, so she married somebody else, and then her husband comes back. You know why she cannot go back to the original husband? Because people are going to think that why, how did she marry another guy? She's a married woman. It must be she was divorced by her first husband. Then she married the second guy, and now we tell the second guy you got to divorce her because you live together. It looks like you were married, she, she, and, and she was divorced the first husband. So the second husband will divorce her. If the first husband takes her back, it looks like you're taking back your, your divorced wife who married somebody in between. That's why you're not allowed to. But um, if, let's say, she was only engaged to a first husband, then we're going to say, Rabbi Yehud says, then we're going to say that people are going to make a different assumption. They're going to say, oh, you know why she married the second guy? Because she was never married to the first guy. They made some kind of a condition. The condition wasn't met. The whole condition unraveled. So she married the second guy. And uh, it's just the first marriage. And if she divorces the second guy and goes back to the first guy, no problem, because she was never married to the first guy. That's what people are going to think. However, when it comes to the case of two sisters, it'll be exactly the opposite. In the case of two sisters, if she was a married woman, nobody thinks there's a condition on marriage, because if you make a marriage conditional, it comes out, all the years you lived together was nus. Nobody will do that. So but, but when it comes to two sisters and they see that this sec, that this sister married Reuben, what are they going to say? They're going to say that what? That Shimon divorced her? So how did she marry Reuben? How did she marry Reuben? So uh, you're not allowed to marry uh, your wife's sister. So therefore, they're going to say, uh, they're going to say that what happened here was a mistake. 
what happened was a total mistake, and therefore she was never really married to Reuben. So she should be able to go back to her husband in this case here, when there's two sisters. It's exactly the opposite of a normal case. But if uh, Reuben was only engaged to his first wife, and then they see that he married his wife's sister, what are they going to say? Probably they were, um, probably that, that Reuben was no longer re really engaged his wife at all because of some kind of condition. That's why he was able to marry his wife's sister because it's, it's not really his wife anymore. And then when um, and then Reuben divorces her and she marries Shimon, no problem. But Reuben cannot take back his wife because then everyone's going to say, ah, you want to marry the sister of your divorcee because you just divorced the, the sister. So that's what he's saying here. Loyal my safer. No, we're talking about a case here of a single witness, but sometimes it is forbidden for Reuben to remarry his wife. It's sometimes permitted. It works as follows. Let's get the parentheses. Hada Osle Arusasig is a one case talking about where Reuben is only engaged to a woman and she goes out with her sister's husband. And Hada Ishtiv Gis. And here's talking about a case where his wife, he was Reuben was married. Ukama Tanakama, Tanakama says, I don't care. I don't care whether Reuben was married to his wife Leah, whether he was only engaged to Leah, and then this whole mishap happened. H's Gisa Asiro, if they come back, uh, Shimon cannot live with his wife again, but the Ishtai Shaya, Reuben can always go back to his wife because she didn't do anything wrong. Come, Rabbi he said, no, it depends. Ishtai Vegisa, Rabbi Yehi says, if it was Reuben who was married to the woman and his brother in law, then nobody's going to think that Reuben made a conditional get, uh, marriage to his wife. So, obviously, how can Reuben live with Shimon's? How in the world can Reuben live with Shimon's uh, wife, which is his wife's sister? They're all going to assume it must have been a great error, it's a mistake. Nobody will make any mistakes when we say to her, you can go back to your, we say to Shimon's wife, go back to Shimon, no problem. And uh, the lack of the name to not have a label, so nobody's gonna say there was a condition made in the marriage. The ain't no place of the acha since he does not ruin Shimon's life because Shimon could take his wife back because everybody realizes that Shimon's wife was never married to Ruven, it was a mistake. So therefore, he can live with his own wife again. But Arusasa, if Leia was merely engaged as a fiance of Ruven and she went out with, with, uh, with Shimon, uh, her sister's husband. The Gisa here, people are going to say, what's going on here? How can Reuben marry his, his uh, wife's sister? Must be, he was never his wife. Must be they were engaged, but the engagement fell through. And therefore, Reuben really was married to uh, Shimon's wife. And then Reuben divorced yes, her in order for her to go back to Shimon. And come out of what? The people will say, hey, how can Reuben take his, um, his first wife's sister? How can he do that? So therefore, Reuben is forbidden to his wife uh, to, to take Leah back. Here we can say the condition unraveled. And therefore, since, since he was married to, uh, to, to Shimon, if, um, if, 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 while it was Shimon's wife, he cannot go back to Shimon. Because the fact is, he was a married woman. Went to his room. So Reuben, Shimon's wife cannot go back to Shimon, and Reuben cannot take back his fiance. Okay, so the mother, I'm going to be the Shmuel. The beauty came along to the name of Shmuel. The halach is like Rabbi Halach is like Rabbi Yesi. And right now, the Gemara thinks of the second version, which is that we assume if they were engaged, that the whole condition was unraveled. It wasn't a real, a real condition. It fell apart. So Maskev, Rabbi Yisra, Rabbi has a question. Do Shmuel believe in this theory that we believe that if somebody was only engaged, we, the first assumption is that there's no longer engaged. Let me ask you a question. Well, it what we learned. The following thing, Yevama, it's these words, Yevama, in the case of a Yevama, Rav Amar Harehi Ish. In the following situation, but it doesn't spell out what the situation is, she's treated like a married woman. The sister in law is treated like a married woman. Ushmul Amar, ain't the case, not like a married woman. What's going on here? Well, Amar Abuna came along and said, I'll tell you the story. What happened was that his brother married a woman. Let's say Reuben married a woman and then Reuben traveled overseas. Vishama Shemes. And then everyone heard that Reuben died and with no children. So therefore, Shimon had to step in and marry Reuben's wife. Everyone heard that Reuben died. But Ahmad ben says, came along Shimon and married Reuben's wife. The Rab, now, but it wasn't Reuben's wife. It was only Reuben's fiance. So Rav says, says, Rav says, well, the fiance of the Torah is his wife. And therefore, comes out that she was a married woman when she lived with Shimon. But so she cannot, she cannot live with Shimon, obviously, if she's a married woman, but nor could she, nor could she go back to Ruven because we had in the Mishnah, a married woman lived with somebody else, even though it wasn't a fault, cannot go back. Shmuel says, no Shmuel says, no, it's, 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 it's not like Ruven was married to her. We're going to assume that when Shimon married her, Ruven, the Kedushin fell apart, and it's not true, really, like, therefore, there is a mistake. And when Shimon married, uh, when Shimon married her, um, and, and, and therefore, it's not like an age of the ish. 
Because we're going to say she was never Ruva's wife. Because the condition fell apart, it was unraveled. So we see that the Shmuel holds that we do believe. Um, sorry, let me run. Rav says we assume the condition unraveled, so therefore Shimon married her, was totally married. And therefore, Shimon cannot divorce and give it back to ruin the first husband because you're not allowed to marry your brother's wife. But Shmuel says we don't think that the condition unraveled. We don't make that assumption at all. And therefore, Shimon was never really married to Reuben's wife because he was a, Reuben, he was a married woman to Reuben. It was a mistake. And therefore, she could go back to Reuben. By Yavama, she can go back to Reuben, to her original husband. So therefore, we see clearly from here that Shmuel does not believe in the theory that Kedushin gets unraveled. And how can you say that Allah like Rabbi Yaisi? And the whole point of Rabbi Yaisi is that we believe by an engaged woman, the fiancé, the Kedushin was conditional unraveled. Says the Yimad, um, um, how do you know? Who told you? The Chiyama Shmuel, Rabbi Yaisi, and Rabbi Yitzchak, who told you that, the, that when Abuna said this whole thing, they learned Pshat and Rabbi Yaisi, Rabbi Yitzchak, way, which is they're arguing by, by whether the distinction is whether she's engaged or she's married, and by engaged, we assume the condition unraveled. Not at all. Dilma Ad Rab Ami we're learning Pshat in Rabbi Yaisi the first word, Rabbi Ami. The difference is whether it's a single witness or a double witness. We're not talking about a fiance because it makes no difference. Maybe nobody holds that um, the condition gets unraveled. We're not even discussing a fiance. We're talking about a married woman. The difference is whether it's based on a single witness or double witnesses. And furthermore, even if you want to say you're right in the Yisrael Nafcha, then my the different parts of the law. Who said we're relying on the part where Rabbi Yaisi said that it's possible, in other words, in the case where it unravels. In the case where Ravel's there for Ruvain ended up living with, um, is, so therefore Ruvain, people are going to assume that it unraveled and therefore he was never his wife's sister. So Ruvain actually was married to Shimon's wife and therefore everything is not, falls apart. And, <clears throat> and therefore, when he divorced, it goes back to Shimon. People are going to say, or look, go through the motion of divorce and, and, and go back to Shimon. He can no longer marry his original wife because she's the sister of his divorcee. That part, no. And nothing to do with that. Rabbi Yaisi said another part. The Dilma ain't a paisel. Maybe when he says that Lach Rabbi Yaisi, he's talking about the part where he doesn't, not the fiancé part. We're talking about the part when he was married, when he was married to her. And therefore, he's married to her. People make the assumption that he was, uh, people make the assumption that he, that um, definitely um, it was a mistake, the whole thing. And therefore, Rabbi Yaisi says that, in fact, Shimon could take his wife back. And Reuben could take his wife back. So therefore, we, that's we, what he's meant. Allah, like Nothing to do with the Arusa part. Who are we holding? Sorry. The very top of Tzadik Vav, 96A. 96A. Very top. Inami, or I can tell you another shot in this whole thing. Who told you Rabbunah's version of the events are correct? Dilma lesser than Rabbunah clap. I can learn another way in understanding the argument of Rabbi Shvul. In fact, they're arguing. Rav says she's like a married woman, and Shvul says she's not. But you know what they're talking about? Generally, a sister in law who's waiting to get married to her brother in law. What is her condition at that time? What happens if she has a one night stand with a stranger? Znus. Is she like treated like a married woman who committed adultery? She can no longer back to, go back to her husband, or no, she's not really tied to anybody in particular. So therefore, she could go back to her brother-in-law. She could go to her brother-in-law, and that's the argument. says she's in, so she's waiting, and she has no absolutely She cannot go back to her brother-in-law. That had She's like a married woman who commits adultery or mifslah and she's disqualified. Ushmul says ain't a She's not like an ish. And did not become possible business. And therefore, she could marry Brahma. Or in Ami or, in fact, a general question. We had this argument before between Rav and Shmuel, whether the Kedushin types in Yavama. If a Yavama, a sister in law waiting for Brahma, decides to get married, accepts Kedushin from another man, is the Kedushin, when it says, Layyir, means it's an Allah, you shouldn't do it, or it means that there's no Havoya, there's no. Kedushin, it does not take effect at all. And that's what they're arguing. Rav says, she's like a married woman. If somebody gives Kedushin to a married woman, nothing happened. The same thing with the Yavama. But like Tafsi about Kedushin, there's no Kedushin. Shmuel says, she's not like a married woman. Bit Tafsi about Kedushin. And Kedushin are nitrous. Says the Gemara, and Kedushin is Chal. But if Liga Bokhada Zim, they argued elsewhere, says Gemara, right. He didn't, they didn't say both things. We, they said one, and we figured out the other one from it. Okay. Next Mishnah. Now, uh, an interesting, an interesting case here. Amrulai. They said to this guy, Meister Ishtacha. So we have one guy called Ruven, 
And there are five women here. Five women. So you have Sarah, and you have Rivka, Rachel, Leah, and Dina. Five women. Um, and the, these five women are interesting how they are connected to each other. The, 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 what's going to happen is as follows. The first two women are going to be women who, who share the same father. The next two women, the, then the second woman and the third woman share not the same father, but the same mother, which means that the third woman and the first woman are not related at all. The first and second are related by paternally. The second and third are maternally. So the number one and number three have no relationship whatsoever, like two strangers. Three and four are related again paternally, which means that four and two are not related at all because the, the two and three are only related through the mother maternally. And three and four are only related through the father. And then four and five are back to maternal. So therefore three and five, so one, three and five are sort of related and two and four are, are um, and uh, what do you call it? And two and four are not related to, to one to one and so on, to, to, to each other. So you might as well follow. This is what happened. Omer um, went over to the guy and said, look, your wife is dead. So he married her sister, paternal sister, Me'avia. From a father. Then what happened when they told him that Mesa, oh, your second wife died as well. So he then married her maternal sister. So this third wife is not related to his first wife. Then they told him Mesa that she died. Venosa married Miavia, married a paternal sister. So number four is related to number three, but not related to number two or one. Then they told Mesa died. The Nosa he married another sister. He really loves these, 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 this family. So he married now another sister, a maternal sister. So this maternal sister is related to number four, but not related to number three. But then what happened was suddenly one day, all five of them came back. All five were alive. What happens here? So the laws as follows. He's allowed to live with the first wife, the third wife, and the fifth wife. But uh, <clears throat> and 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 the uh, and the other two are, are free. But also and he is <coughs> and he is forbidden to to live with the second and fourth because the second was a sister of his wife, and the fourth was a sister of his wife because number one was his wife, number three became his wife, and number four is a sister of number three. So therefore, they couldn't. Um, what do you call it? their marriage is not a marriage. <clears throat> So, and, and let's say if he dies, number one, number three, number five, if one of his brothers marries any one of those five, of those one or three or five, right. the rest are exempt. They're all valid yeah. wives of, uh, of this Ruvain. Number one, number three, number five. So if, what, if brother Shimon marries, uh, you know, number one, three and five are exempt as well because they're co-wives. What happens the other way around? Sorry. What happens if he, um, if he um, had relations with the second wife, the, the Gemara is going to explain what it means here is, it turned out to be the first wife did die. The rest didn't. So the first wife died, then the second wife was allowed to marry. The sister was allowed to marry. But number three, he couldn't marry because three was a sister of two. But number four, he could marry because four was, was related to three, which he didn't marry. And four is not related to two. But five, he couldn't marry because five is a sister of four. So, Mutter Mishneer Levi is, he's allowed to live with the second and fourth wife, who paitra to the same, exempt their, their co wives. But uh, in other words, if he lives with either number two and number four, the other one is exempt. But for us, Bishlish is a Hamish, but he cannot live with number three and number five. The ain B is Achman Paitra Sarasa. And therefore, if, he, if <coughs> the brother goes ahead and marries, which they're allowed to, if one of the brothers goes ahead and decides to marry number three and number five, because they're never related to their brother. Fine, but it does has no bearing on number two, number four. They still need chalitza you. That's the first part of the mission. Then we're going to learn about, we had before that a nine-year-old kid, uh, can, since he can do beer, so if he, if by midst of yibum, he has an effect on yibum as well. That, you know, whatever, as we'll see in the Gemara, according to the Tanakhama, if he has beer, if he has a relationship with his sister-in-law, it's as if a, an adult gave a mimer. A mimer, which means give kedushin, is only rabbinical. And the moment uh, one of the brothers gives a mimer, for example, gives her a ring, then all the other brothers are disqualified from having anything to do with her, midrabbana. And if one of the brothers decided, yes, to have something with her, ruins it on the person who gave the mimer. We're going to treat the nine-year-old that whatever a nine-year-old does is like an adult who does a mimer. But 
Um, on the other hand, they're not really married. So as far as Yibam is concerned, he made some kind of an acquisition here because it's Mela Shemaim. But as far as a married woman, it's not his wife. Doesn't need a divorce. A nine-year-old kid cannot get married. Only if a bar mitzvah, according to the Bach, interesting, the Bach in the beginning of Shalom learns that a 12-year-old, if his if his if parents gave him a wife, then Mahatayla, maybe they're considered married. Interesting Bach in the beginning of uh, Ebenezer. Okay, so what's the relevance of all this? Ben Teisha, a nine-year-old who if he goes ahead with three, four brothers and one of the brothers is nine years old and he goes to the sister-in-law and gives her a ring. He ruins it now for the rest of the brothers. None of them can actually be meyabamer at all. They cannot be meyabamer because we learned that only one brother can, can have a relation with the sister-in-law, not more than one. Only one and not today, but not two. And therefore, by this kid giving a mimer, we, we, uh, he disqualified all the other brothers. Um, and the brothers, if they uh, do something, it ruins his abilities to do anything. But furthermore, when it comes to him, it's only if he first, when can he affect his brothers if he was first? He came over to her and gave her, we'll see later what exactly he did, but he gave her a mimer or something. There's four different things that the brothers that you can do. Either give her a mimer, which Madrabanan strengthens your uh, ties, or you give her chalitza, which your title says is a way of severing the ties, or you gave her a get, which only Madrabanan we say that the get means that nobody can marry her because you showed Ashallah even as you have no interest in, in developing the, the legacy of your brother, but you still need a chalitza, but nobody can marry anymore. And then you have Yibum. So if the younger brother did, was initiated first, some kind of connection, ruse them for everybody else, they can no longer marry her. However, but the brothers, even after the youngster did something, if the brothers come in and do something afterwards, they ruin it for him. But if he does something after the brothers, the older brothers did, he cannot ruin it for them. And the Gemara will explain it. Kate said, what do you mean? For example, the Mishnah spells it out. And the way we learn the Mishnah, it seems as follows. Ben He actually had relations with his sister-in-law. That's it. None of the brothers can have relations with her anymore. Finished. But if one of the brothers had relations with her, sorry, but the brother didn't really give a maimer, that if one of the brothers come along and gave a, a maimer or a get, ruins what the kid did. Even though the kid did something already, it ruined what the kid did. And we will explain to you what was going on here. <clears throat> um, and the reason is a child, even when he does beer, it's not considered a, a, a he didn't uh, consummate the relationship. It's like only, a, it's only treated like a maimer, which means you, you have a partial bond, but not a full bond. You still have room in this woman. There's still part of her that's not bonded yet. So if an adult comes along and, and, and continues growing that bond, he basically in, in, just intercepted whatever this young young man is doing and uh, ruins it for him. So Gemara now explains. Says the Gemara, um, first of all, Gemara goes back to the first part of the mission and says, um, right now the Gemara thought that when the Mishnah says the second part and after they heard that the first one died it's only the second and fourth wife that's tied what's going on here? you start off saying the first, third, and fifth then you tell me the second and fourth what's, what, what happened here? the second part of the Mishnah is talking about where the first woman actually did die and if she did die then the second wife is the real wife and then the fourth one okay let's talk about the Ben Shonim says the Gemara it seems like what that only if he initiated first, then he rules it for the brothers. But if he, if he comes in afterwards, he does not affect his brothers at all. May I ask a question? Is that so? But Tani Rabzid Rabzid said, Ben Rabbeisha, if somebody makes, let's say, uh, a minor in his sister law, which means with Rabbanan, you have made a bond. But it's not a total bond. Mahat Taylor doesn't even recognize it. Here we have clearly a nine-year-old came after the adult made the mimer and he had relations with her. Pasla ruins it. So why do you tell me that that a child after the adult did something has no bearing? It fetish does. Amri will say depends what the youngster did. If he did a mimer after the adult did a mimer, it's meaningless. But if the youngster went ahead and had intimate relations. Then it ruins the mimer of the adult. Amri be a puzzle. I feel a bit If the youngster had be it, then it ruins it. Even if he if he if he had relations after the brother made the mimer. 
But Maimir, but if, if if all he did was a Maimir, Tchila Apostle, Say Apostle, but if all the youngster did was a Maimir, gave a ring or something, it only is effective if it happened before the adult did his Maimir. But once the adult did his Maimir, the cotton's Maimir is meaningless. Says he, what are you telling me? But Bia of a cotton is meaningful even after the adult did a Maimir. Is that so? Well, Bia, if the Apostle will tell us a clear on Mishnah, Elisha, who plays the Tchila, Mishnah clearly spells out. That the youngster can only uh, parcel if it's initial. The hain chilav aside, but adults even beginning and the end. And then Mishnah gives an example. Kate said, "Ben teishes shem yachad shabal yemempted." Bal means he had beer, and yet the Mishnah says that only is effective if it happened before the brothers got involved. And yet you're telling me that he, that beer even after the brothers did maimed is effective. So the Gemara, you're right. Bechsuri mechsa. Mishnah is missing a couple of words. This is how you should learn. Bahachi tani. This is how you should learn. read our Mishnah. Ben teishes on the mechadu pais of chila. If he's a nine-year-old, it only is effective if he start initiated first. Behein pais of chila besayt, and they are effective even after the child did his thing. When do we say that a youngster has no bearing after the adults? If the youngster went ahead and gave a maimer after the adult gave a maimer, too late. I will be a if the youngster went ahead and had be a. Paiselas afilu beside ruins it even at the end. Kate said, and this is an example of mission. So, example of mission is to show where the child can affect be affected after the adults did their minor. Ben tesh shani yemechad haboy yem te pasul aydeachad pasuls through his brothers. Says the Gemara, and I'm going to ask question all around. Umis le my maklal aydeachin. Are you telling me that what that a nine year old has a minor at all and he ruins his brothers? You're telling me that a, that a youngster can give a maimer a ring and it prevents the brothers from marrying her. Is that so? But Tanya, we learned in a b'raise. Ben echad, hu echad, the youngster can only uh, get involved with her in one way. But the brothers can do four things. Hu the only thing that he can do to have a bearing on the brothers is if he has beer relations. But the brothers, they ruin it for him Either Bibia, if they have relations, obviously that becomes the full fledged wife, or Bemaime, they just gave a ring, or Beget gave a get, or Chalitza gave a Chalitza. So we see clearly from here that, that uh, the youngster can only, the only time the youngster's bond means anything is if it was Bia, not a Mimer. And you just said before that if the youngster gave a Mimer, and you made a distinction in our Mishnah whether we're talking about the youngster made a Mimer or the youngster had Bia. Look, the youngster has no Mimer. Says he might have not true. The youngster, of course, he has, a, if he can give a maimer, and it ruins for all the other brothers, but if other brothers did maimer, he can no longer do it. I, what about the b'raise? I'll explain to you. Bia, the apostle ben b'chil ben b'sai, Bia, when it comes to the youngster, it makes no difference if he initiated or is after the, his adult brothers, therefore the mish, the b'raise mentions it. Uh, but maimer, if he mentions maimer, then he has to qualify. It depends if it's initially, if it was initial, or it would happen afterwards. Too many words. The betchil apostle that's only effective if the if the youngster did it first. The safe way apostle, but if he did it after the older brothers did a mind, it doesn't mean anything. Therefore, the psikla doesn't mention it at all. In fact, it but now we We actually learned we said mishmol yesh loy get. We learned that a youngster has a get has a divorce, even though a minute ago we said only bia. But no, a youngster can also if a youngster gives a divorce to this yevama, she can no longer live with any of the other brothers. So we see that the brayse was not limited only to beer. It's also talking about it just didn't want to mention other things because then he has to start adding all these extra clauses. It depends when it happened, before or after. Too difficult. But the youngster has a has has the option of giving her a maimer, has the option of giving her a divorce, and so on. Time when we learn, yes, le get, but yes, le maimer, may may clearly say that a youngster can give a get and a youngster can give a maimer. Says the Gemot, is that so? The sober, I may a yes, le get, as I may really hold that a youngster can give a get. But Tanya, we learned also be as bentesha can maimer be It says that a, a nine year old has beer with his sister in law, it's not as effective as an adult, will give it the same kind of effect as an adult who gives maimer, which means it's a partial bond. The mayor says no. Also, he says also chalitzas bentesha. When it comes to that, a nine-year-old can also give a chalitza. If you gave the chalitza, it's not it's not really fully effective. You still have to give another chalitza for the, by the adult. But we'll treat it can get the goggle. We'll treat it like a, a get by an adult, which means that now nobody has the option of marrying her. Now, what did the mayor compare it to? To a get of an adult. If you tell me that mayor holds that a youngster can give a divorce as well. So just say that the chalitz of a youngster is like a divorce of a youngster. Why introduce like the get, like the divorce of an adult? Says the 
the Misa, if your mayor holds that a youngster, a nine-year-old can also give a divorce, then at least they can get to say that the chalitza of the youngster to his sister-in-law is no different than if you were given a divorce. Is that right? A mayor holds that a, a, a nine-year-old cannot give a divorce, issue a divorce at all. Omer, we never sure, no. Not, not a proof at all. Definitely a, nine, a nine-year-old has the ability to give a divorce to sister-in-law, therefore prevents all the other brothers from marrying her. But Isla, he does have it. But the Zut, it is weaker, not as potent as if he would have given Chalitza. Chalitza of a nine-year-old is much more potent, much more effective than a divorce of a nine-year-old. And, and tomorrow I'll explain, explain, explain how. That, um, tomorrow I'll explain the follows. We have two uh, views. If you can give a get, when you give a woman a divorce, then not only she divorce, but you're not allowed to live anymore with her, with her sister, with her mother, with her daughter. And by Ivama, the same thing. The get is only effective mid Rabbanon, but you're not allowed to live with any of her relatives. So Ragamlil says, if one of the brothers gave her a divorce, and then the other brother gave her a divorce, that second divorce is meaningless. That second brother can marry anyone, any of the relatives of this girl, because the second divorce had, had no bearing whatsoever, no effect. So the Rabbi, so according to Rabbi says, in get, I get, once you give one divorce, there's no second divorce. If another brother gave a divorce, it's ineffective. Is hadi mili begot lachagot. That's if one adult brother followed the other adult brother, or cotton lacha cotton, one minor followed another minor. Ava god lacha cotton. But if first a cotton gave a, a divorce, and then a god will give a divorce, mahani. It does help. So we see that the cotton's divorce is far weaker than a godl's divorce when it comes to a sister-in-law. And that's why uh, Ramea, when he, but he was say, when he said a chalitza, he said the chalitza is much more effective. And the chalitza is like um, a, a godl who gave a divorce, which means that whoever gave the, the chalitza cannot live anymore with her relatives. Um, the Rabbanon, according to Rabbanon, the Amri, you say, yes, get after get. Rabbanon hold that you could give one get after get. So if two of the brothers gave her a divorce, both of them cannot live with any of her relatives. Honey, mean we got a godl one adult after another adult. They're both the same effect. I be cut not cut, they're both the same effect. I will cut not a godl if a youngster after a godl gives a get, it has no bearing. Lay behind his help, he's permitted to marry their relatives, nothing happened. Next Mishnah. The Tzadik Vav of Abay is the very top of the page. Says the Mishnah, a nine-year-old, a nine-year-old had relations, intimate relations with his sister-in-law. Then another brother who was nine years old, you know, somewhere between nine and Bamitsa, had relations with his sister-in-law. The second brother ruins it for the first brother. Why? Because the first brother, when he had his marital relation, we said before, it's only like a mind, which means it's only a partial bond. There's still part of her that hasn't been tied up. So when the second brother came along, gave a maimer, he now, yesh maimer, acha maimer, because there's still room in her that someone else can also uh, make some kind of a bond with her. And since you cannot have two brothers in law living with one sister in law, the second brother has to give a divorce. And the moment the second brother gives a divorce, it ruins it for the first brother. He can no longer proceed to, uh, to live with her because um, once he gave a divorce, you showed you don't want the legacy to remain. Rab Shimon disagrees. He says, I'm not sure. I don't hold of this partial bond. He said, I'm not sure. And the same thing by Maimer. Rab Shimon says, when it comes to a Maimer, remember we had a long time ago an argument where, where the Maimer is a partial bond. Rab Shimon says, I'm not sure if a Maimer is a 100% bond or zero bond. There's no thing as a partial bond. Either you're connected or you're not connected. I'm just not sure what a Maimer, where Maimer fits in. So Rav Shimon said the same thing with this youngster. This youngster having beer, I'm not sure if it was if, if that was an acquisition, so it's 100 percent or I'm not sure maybe nothing happened. And therefore, the man of Sheikh, if the first brother went ahead and gave her and had beer with her, he could continue and marry her, and the second brother has no beer. Why? If the first brother's beer is a form of acquisition, then the second brother uh, acquisition meant nothing. And if the first beer meant nothing, then the second brother also meant nothing. And therefore, he's allowed to live with her later. Yom Rav Shimon says, Loi Paisel, does not ruin it. And as, as I just explained to you why. Ben Tesh, 
what happens if a nine-year-old had relations with his sister-in-law and then and then he had relations with a co-wife. Remember, you can only have one Yivama, you can't have two Yivamas. So therefore, Paisa, they asked, he ruined it for himself. Because since his only part of her was bonded when he had Bia, she was like a Maimur. So then when he has Bia with a co-wife, now part of her is bonded and you can't have two Yivamas. So he has to give a divorce to the second one. And once he gave a divorce to the second one, you can no longer live with the Yivama. So he ruined it for himself. Rab Shimon says the basic, the same logic as before. If the first one was um, was totally uh, what do you call it? was a proper was totally married, then uh, nothing happened when he went to the second one. So therefore, not a problem. And if you tell me that when he had beer with the first with his first wife, uh, with the, the first Yivama, nothing happened. So nothing happened when he met the tsar either. So therefore, late paisel does not disqualify. And when he comes adult, he goes and marries. So you want to tanya? Well, Shimon explained the chumah exactly what I just said. If the first B is a B, the mission is a B, then nothing happened the second time with the second brother. And the B is showing any B. If the first brother's B is not a B, nothing happened. The B is not a B. Nothing happened the second time either. Says the Gemara. Another thing we can see here, we make no difference here. We have two cases in the Mishnah. One is where he, when he alone goes ahead, and the second case was when he alone goes ahead and has relations with two women. And the first case was when two brothers had relations with the same wife. Now, we're learning as if, the, if we are equating the two. It makes no difference whether one brother with two wives or two brothers with one wife. There's, there's a mimer after, according to Tanakama, there's a mimer after a mimer. You left some residual space over there for the second mimer to take effect. However, not everyone agrees. Masnitz in the lake of Benazir. Amisha definitely is not conform with Benazir. Why? But the Tanya, Benazir, Benazir said, Yesh mimer acha mimer bishnei yavami. I believe that with two different people, every one of the brother-in-law were given the power to marry a sister-in-law. So therefore, if the two brothers give a mimer, each one had the power to do something, and therefore it's affected. Both of them are affected. But if it's two sisters, but one guy, one guy was only given the power to marry one of them. So his second mimer is meaningless. But our mission equates the two as if no difference. Next mission. Ben teaches on a nine-year-old, Shabal Yivam Toi, a nine-year-old had relations with his sister-in-law, the mace. And then he dies. Uh, this is what happened. Um, Reuben died and left behind a wife. And he had two brothers, Shimon and Levi. And, um, okay, before we learn this, we had in the Gemara before, if you remember, a case where there were three adults, Reuben, Shimon and Levi. It was Reuben, Shimon and Levi. And Reuben died. Shimon made a maimer to Reuben. We have a rule that says, according to Tanakama, that you cannot um, marry a woman that has a bond to two men. A zik of shnei yivamim. So what happened was, Reuben was married to a woman, and then he died, and then Shimon made a maimer. So, but Shimon making a maimer, so now, with the Rabbanon, she's married to Shimon, but Mahatayda, she's married to Reuben. So now she is a zika of two men, of Reuben and of Shimon. And if Shimon dies, Levi cannot marry her because it's a woman, a zika of shtei yavamin. That's what we learned before. So now we're going to talk about, and so too also if there was a tzara there, if let's say Shimon had another wife, then if there's a tzara there, then the tzara as well cannot, um, can, you cannot marry Shimon's other, his real wife, you can't marry either. Because it looks like you're going to give chalitza, you have to give chalitza to Reuben's wife. Right, because Mahatoida, she's really Ruva's wife. But you have to give her chalitza. Once you gave her chalitza, because it looks like she's Shimon's wife, because you gave her a minor, people will think, oh, you can give chalitza to one woman and she can marry the other woman. And especially if you gave chalitza first, you can't do that. Even though technically he can marry Shimon's wife first and then give chalitza to the other wife, but we're scared that Xera, that he might reverse the order and give chalitza to Ruva's wife first. And once you give chalitza to Ruva's wife, since with the Rabbana, she's attached to Shimon, only one woman has a relation. Once you give a chalitza, you can't marry any of the other women. So therefore, that's a rule there. Now the question, this mission here is, where the second, where Reuven was an adult, Levi was an adult, but Shimon was a nine-year-old. Reuven died, and Shimon was the one who stepped in and um, and had relations with uh, with Reuven's wife, Leah. And Shimon now, is um, is his relation is merely considered a minor. And then Shimon died. So where now she it? is where is Ruben's it now, wife. Please? Sorry, I, lost it. I just lost it. Away. We're by the Mishnah on Tzadik Vavah Mabez. We're just about to start. Uh, the second Mishnah on, on Tzadik Vavah Mabez. 96B2. 
Okay. Bottom. So what happened was, so again, Reuben's, Reuben died, left behind a wife. Shimon had relations with her, but we just said before that relations of a nine-year-old is no different than a mimer. So Shimon therefore has a tie to this woman and she's also tied to Reuben. And then Shimon died. So Levi, can Levi marry or not? So he says here, So he had relations with his sister, Reuben's wife, Umais, and then Shimon died, this nine-year-old. Levi is Levi cannot marry this woman because this woman is tied to two men, Reuben and Shimon. And therefore, he can only give chalitza. Nasa Isha of a general rule. For nine year old married a woman and he died. There's no Yibam or anything else because we don't recognize the Kedushin. There's, there's two things there about acquisition of Yibam and the myth and the and marriage. There's no marriage under Bar Mitzvah. So therefore, there's nothing. What happened in the following case? So a nine year old goes ahead and marries Reuben's wife, right? So now, but so he, this woman, Hatayr, is still Reuben's wife, not Shimon's wife, because a bee of a nine year old is only like a maimon. But Misha Tigdal, when uh, Misha Hegdal, when, Ru, when Shimon grew up, became by mitzvah, he married another woman. So now he has a full fledged wife, but he didn't have any relations with Reuben's wife. So he never converted the, his relationship with Reuben's wife to a wife, Mahatayra. He had relations with her before he became by mitzvah. But afterwards, you know, he still lived together, but never had any relations, which means technically she's still Reuben's wife, Mahatayra. She never got released from it. She only has a mimer with Shimon's wife. And Shimon now has two wives. He has this mimer with Reuben's wife and he has his own wife. So the din is, if he had no continual relations with the first wife, after he became a mitzvah, so Reuben's wife um, cannot ever marry Levi because it's a woman with two, two relationships. But Vahashnia, Shimon's um, real wife, the nine-year-old real wife, can either get chalitza or can get yibum, which is different than what we learned before. Before we learned that the tzara also cannot have yibum because she is the tzara of a woman who's going to get chalitza. And, and, we don't, and therefore we don't want that, even though it's Reuben's wife, but it looks like she's Shimon's wife, and it's a problem. And how come by yibama we allow it? And we'll talk about that. And Rab Shimon says, no. Meyabim le'ezer she'yitzer. Rab Shimon says, no, I have no problem whatsoever. As Marvel will explain, he can uh, whichever one he wants because he doesn't believe in this thing that she's considered attached. Remember again, he says, either, Rab Shimon says, either it's 100% Shimon's wife or 100% Reuben's wife. So if he says, Manushech, if it's, uh, uh, if Maimed does nothing, it's Reuben's wife. So, of course, he can marry Reuben's wife. And if Maimed does something, it's 100% Shimon's wife. So again, he can marry Shimon's wife. It's not a, a person of two ties to two men. She's only tied to one. The question is, which one? So if Shimon says, Meyabim le'ezer she'yitzer, he can meyabim whichever one you want, either Reuben's wife, which is Manushech, either Reuben's wife, Shimon's wife, another one, you'll to. And the chayl and shnei, you still to that one because maybe it's really Reuben's wife and therefore Shimon's wife needs to be released as well. And now what's considered a cotton? Echad shu ben teshan yim echad, when he's nine years old, echad shu ben teshan, even he's 20 years old, if lahevish te sara didn't read puberty, in all of these didn't mistreat like a cotton. Says Yimad Amar, Rabbi says, Rabbi, hold on, Amar Abadam. This is what the rabbi says. Zikr shnei yivamin mechad chaltu ulei mamah. This is what we say, that the zikr of two yivamin, you go and give chalitza. And you don't do yibum. Don't think the reason is only because there's another wife involved. Shimon had another wife, and therefore it looks like you can be marrying two wives. And that's why we said do chalitz. We're worried about that if you that you might go ahead and marry the tzara. No, the hacha leka tzara. Because now Mishnah, in the first case, there's no tzara whatsoever. There's no other wife here, and yet michas chalitz yibum The problem here is it looks like you're the wife of two of two different men of Reuben of Shimon, and that's why not because we're worried about the co-wife. It's because you're the wife of two different men. It's two different obligations on you, and we cannot marry. There's no mitzvah yibum there. No, she's remained. Okay, a youngster, his marriage is not valid. We learned this. Talk about we learned. Shaiti cotton should not so they got married. She needs to get married, and the mesu, and eventually they died. Pturis menachalitzim la yibum. They are potter from from yibum chalitza and all that because their marriage is not recognized. Okay, Ben Teisha, Mishahigl. Now, the question is, so the Mishnah says over here that Shimon's real wife is, is Levi's allowed to marry Shimon's real wife. He cannot marry 
the Shimon's wife that he, he was a nine-year-old, but he was a nine-year-old and he had a beer, which like a maimer, that he cannot do, could be treated like the, ma- the, the wife of Reuben and of Shimon, he can't uh, marry the Yibam of, of Zik of two men, but you could marry the Tzadah. Now the question is, why can you marry the Tzadah when we learned before that you can't marry the Tzadah? We said that before you can, because it looks like you are marrying two wives of the same man. The Yasub be a bentes, and even the chalitza, it looks like you are marrying that you that, you, uh, that there were two yivamas from one man. One of them you have chalitza, one of them you marry, which you know how to do. Once you give chalitza, you cannot marry him with the other wife. In fact, it's your wife, your brother's wife, and uh, Issa Chorus. Says the Gemara, the Yasub be a bentes kemayim of the God rules. So how come the mission here allows it? If we treat the nine-year-old as if it's a maimer by adult, we learned before already that in that case, Shimon's other wife cannot marry Levi either. Omar Rav, Rav says, you're right. Loy also be his mentes ke maimer be We don't make it in every respect. A nine, even though we lived before that a nine-year-old maimer is enough to ruin it for his brothers, but not in this case to ruin it for the co-wife, and therefore the co-wife can get married. So not in every respect that we treat the be of a nine-year-old like a maimer. However, Shmuel says, Asu va asu. So uh, by what? No, we definitely treat it as a nine-year-old like a mime in every respect, including the affecting the co-wife. So if you tell me also, also treat it like as if um, the co-wife should be forbidden. Why is the mission say you let him marry the co-wife? We learned that the, that this mission here actually argues with the previous mission before. The previous Tana that said that you're not allowed to marry the co-wife, Gaza Mishim Tzara. He was worried about the Tzara. He was worried about that if we can allow, we're going to allow, we're, not, we, we're worried that you're going to marry the Tzara thinking that it's Ruben's wife. And the problem is that maybe it's Shimon's wife or partially Shimon's wife. And you're going to marry the Tzara. People are going to think that two people, two wives of one man, you can deal with both. Give one Chalitza and one Yibum. You worry about the Tzara. And therefore, no difference in nine-year-old or thirty-year-old is forbidden. The co-wife as well. That's what the previous model. I the previous Gemara talks about an adult, not about a child. Bashmin and Begadol talks about an adult. But who do you cut the thing? Applies to a child. The high dama Godless. Why talk about an adult? Should the Begadol cut? Because that that whole case there, all the cases they are talking about adults. That's all. But really, no difference. According to the previous Gemara, definitely in our mission over here, they would not allow the co-wife of Shimon to marry Leah. But oh, our town here, the high town, the Hachas for but our town in this mission holds also. He holds clearly that you are allowed to marry the co wife, the Lagaza Mishim Tzara. And he's not worried about Tzara. He says the only problem with Shimon's wife is it's a woman of two that's two uh, that is bound, bonded to two men. Once you give Khalisi Elisha, she's out of the picture, out of the equation, and then you can go ahead and marry the Tzara. Holding by God, they can do that. I so why only tell us regarding a child? I go because we're talking about a child. Where is it now, please? Where? Ninety-six B five. And B five. B five. The Gemara tells us an interesting story. It says the Gemara also Rabbi Loz Rabbi Loz went Omer the Shmaita to Bein Medrasha. He said over this whole Gemara in Yeshiva. He told over this whole thing, but he did not mention Rabbi Yechel's name at all. Rabbi Yechel is one who said that, yes, that we treat a child as if it's a maimon and you're not allowed to marry the co-wife, but he didn't, he didn't mention that at all. Shomar Rabbi Yechel heard that his student Rabbi Loza is saying things that he stole from him and doesn't even mention his name. Iqbit, he's very upset. Yeah. All the Gabe Rabbi Amir Rabbi so Rabbi Amir Rabbi two of his big students, came in to appease him. Um, Rulay, they said to him, like Kahoya Maisa Wasn't there once a story in the shul of Tveria? There was a story about a Nagar, Shiyesh Bereshai um Glustra. There was a story about um uh, we're talking about a, a, a lock, a bolt on a door, and at the head of the bolt it had this like knob, and um Shanechal <clears throat> Kubai Rabalaza and Abyasi they had an argument whether it's mukta or not mukta because you can use the knob. To uh, crush things with it, so therefore it has a din of a kli, a kli shemalach to listen. There's a big difference in laws of mukta whether it's a kli or not a kli. If something is not a kli, it's not a utensil, it's not a vessel, then it's mukta machmas atma. You can never move it. But if it's a kli, even though it's dedicated to do activities which are forbidden on Shabbos, you're allowed to move it if you need the space. You're allowed to move it to for the turn of If you need the place, you're allowed to move it, or if you need it for itself to, to you know, to, to whatever for to, for its good, you're allowed to move it. So gufo turn of so they had this big argument, and they got so, they were so antagonistic to each other, 
Ad shikaru sefer toyle bechamasa. They destroyed a sefer toyle in their anger. So the Gemara Karu said that they what they ripped up a sefer toyle chas v'shol. And the aim of shenikra sefer toyle they got so angry and the hands were flailing about and everything else they ripped the sefer toyle. In the Chavas year, a beautiful Chavas year in chapter um, in his Chuvah Kufun Beis he talks about how when you learn he brings from some svarim that when you learn you have to clap your hands you have to make noise when it says in the pasuk gigia kapecha kisaychol the work of your hands you will eat it means when you learn you have to get so excited that not just use the grubber finger and you have your thumb flying around you should clap your hands and yell and scream because that's the only way you're going to absorb learning properly not by muting oneself. So, so, um, so that's what they're saying. They're saying Rabbi Yechelen. So um, we get very angry. And what happened was, Rabbi Yechelen Kisner saw this. He witnessed all this. I'm 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 amazed. Now one day, this shul will become a church, a, a place for idol worshiping. Because he got angry. There's a famous saying called so Anybody gets angry. As if he worshipped idols. And no one knows where that saying comes from. So it comes from right here, even though it's, we're paraphrasing what he says here. Because they got angry, he says it must be a place of idol worshipping. And Taka happened that this shul became eventually a church, a house of idol worship. So that's where the saying comes from right here. Anyway, he got, in fact, he got even angrier. Didn't help. Um, why did he get angrier? He said, Chavrusa, Nami. Look, you made even worse, he said to Rabbi Amadabasi. Those two people over there, Rabbi Yeshi and Rabbi Loza, were friends. They were friends. So therefore, they got angry with each other and the others. But this Rabbi Loza is my student. Are you equating my student to two Tamil Chami who are friends and they have a right to get upset? My student should listen to what I say and have their cheretz and repeat things in my name. All the Gabir of Yaakov Yidu. Yaakov Yidu went to visit him. Amalei, he said to him the following. Let's try to appease him. He said, you know, it says in Pasuk, in the beginning of Yeshua, Kashat Tziva Hashem as Moshe, just like Hashem told Moshe, Kain Tziva Moshe is Yeshua. Whatever Hashem told Moshe, Moshe instructed Yeshua. Kain also Yeshua, and Yeshua then related to the Yidin, Lehesed Dover, Mekol Hashem Tziva Hashem Moshe. He did not deviate one word from what Moshe Rabbeinu was told by Hashem. Now, so he asked Rabbi Echel, the Chia called Dover Shama Yeshua. You think every time Yeshua said something, Moshe said this. Yeshua used to dash him. But everyone knew, everyone knew, Where did, what's the source? Where did Yeshua get all his knowledge from? From Moshe Rabbeinu. You don't have to tell anybody, because we all knew. After Rabbi Loza Tamitcha, Rabbi Loza, your student, he dash a stam. But everyone knows, whatever he says is in your name. He said to them, he said to them, Why don't you, Rabbi Amir Abbasi, know how to peace somebody like your our friend, Rabbi Yaakov Aridi? So, Rabbi Yechel, Rabbi Yechel, my time at Kopi Kulai, why did he get so angry? What was he so upset about? So, Rabbi Yechel didn't say his name. Big deal. What's the big deal? The Amar, Rabbi Yechel, interesting. The Gemara says, Kala Oymad Dovah Shev Oymad Meh Begul Elayla. His mother could have just answered. It bothered him that he's not trying to bring a gula to the world, bring Mashiach, because he's not mentioning my name. But Gemara says something else. He did it for personal benefit. And that is, I want to live in your tents, in all the worlds. We know there are two worlds. What do you mean he wants to live and live in his tent in both worlds? How do you live in both worlds? My will, my, my request is I want people when they say things in this world, they should say in my name. Any rabbi, any time of chacham, any time of chacham that you quote them and you say things in their name, but Olam has in this world, sees safe sub divers by cover. His lips are moving in his grave. That means as if he's learning in Olam has it. Not only is he learning in Ganei Olam Haba, but as if he's also going to get the reward, as if he's continuing to learn in Olam has it. You can't do mitzvahs in Olam Haba. But by, by, by his lips moving in Olam Haza is as if he's doing a mitzvah and he'll continue getting more and more schar. And he doesn't want to miss that opportunity. Sorry, how, how, could, how could David Amelach quote Rabbi Shimon uh, B. 
We should be called uh, the uh, generations uh, later. Yeah, good question. Whenever the Gemara does that, and we don't need to go down another, we have a number of times, Tanoim, Rabbi Akiva was, was saying, like Abai, whatever it is. We're just saying is that that this that Rabbi Yechon in the name of Shechai espoused this idea, but David Melch knew this already, and that's what he was doing. We only heard it from Rabbi Yechon in the name of Shechai. Ben Benzeda, we tell about Shimon Nezila. My quarter, what exactly is the posse? How do you know that the lips are moving? This world? So that's why Rabbi Yechon wanted. He wanted the benefit of being able to do a mitzvah in this world. But says the posse, the chichech and your palate is kiyayin hatoyv is like this wonderful, beautiful wine that hoylech ledoidim esharim. That it goes to um to my my doidi, to my friend the meishadim it goes there that it goes there with all uh, um, you know innocence and all those who are righteous doivim sipsei yushenim and the, the the those who are lying there the lips are moving like what um kekoyme shal anovim like um like a, a whole group of grapes or a, a basket full of grapes that heated up ma koyme shal anovim just like when you when you heat up a whole basket full of grapes. As soon as you put your finger in, as soon as you put a finger in, it begins to like bounce back and forth. It's elastic. As soon as you say something, the name has it. Their lips are moving in the grave. And that is what Abiyah kind of wanted, why he wanted so much of Allah to say things in his name. That's why he's upset, but he was appeased. By what Rabbi Lazar said, it's, it's as if to say that since everyone knows it comes from you, it's as if they said in your name and it's good enough. Okay, Baruch Hashem, we caught up.